Hello, and welcome to another teaching by 119 Ministries. Our ministry teaches that the whole Bible is still true and directly applicable in our lives. If you would like to know more on what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Speaking in tongues, meaning different languages, has been a topic of debate for many for some time in the body of Christ. We believe this needs to be addressed, along with some surrounding topics that seem to go hand in hand. We know that the Spirit cannot contradict Scripture. So let's examine the Scriptures and see where our understanding of the Spirit lines up accordingly. First we have the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Anything that is claimed under the name of the Spirit has to be in agreement with these. Let it be known that if someone claims something as from the Spirit and it doesn't flow in harmony with the fruit of the Spirit, then we have contradictions. Then we have the gifts of the Spirit. The most debated and disagreed upon is that of the gift of speaking in tongues. Many have even said that tongues are not for today as that gift has already served its purpose. Then they refer to 1 Corinthians as their proof text. 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. But let's continue reading on for the context here. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. If we are going to use this text to say that tongues is done away with, then we are forced to say that knowledge has passed away as well, that perfection is now here, that the writers of the New Testament saw the poor reflection, but those of us today see face to face. That we now know all mysteries of the scriptures with no questions to be asked. Really? This is a direct referral to when Christ reigns on earth for the millennium. Jeremiah 31, No longer will a man teach his neighbor, or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This happens when the new covenant is finalized at the end of the tribulation. Further details on that topic, please see our part two of the end of day series titled Confirming the Covenant. We must understand that tongues serves two purposes, edification of the body of Christ with the interpreter and edification to the individual believer. This is not to say that every believer will speak in tongues. We'll cover that a little later. We know that speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit, but that's only one gift. What are the others? They are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. So, here are the nine gifts as given in chapter 12. Much of the rest of chapter 12 explains how we all are part of the body of Christ, though we are different and may have different gifts. Going into chapter 13, it explains how we should seek and administer the gifts, that being in love. And from that focus, chapter 14 begins. But why is there controversy over the gift of tongues? Let's begin in chapter 14 and review it in detail to see what the scriptures teach us on the gift of tongues. 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Okay, first we must note that we are instructed here to desire spiritual gifts. Please pause for a moment. Examine your heart and ask yourself, am I truly desiring a spiritual gift? It is through these gifts that the Father blesses, encourages, and strengthens His people through His people. It should be our desire to bless our fellow brothers and sisters through the gifts the Father has given us. Please pray about this so that your desire will not be on earthly things, but on that which the Father desires us to have, spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy, as the verse says. Moving on with verse 2. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Now we see verse 2 and 3 going into the explanation of why and distinguishing it from that of the gift of tongues. It shows how prophecy edifies the church, yet tongues by itself does not. Thus, our focus should be on that which builds one another up in the fellowship. Verse 4 then continues, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. This is important to note. The one who speaks in tongues does indeed edify himself. This actually ties with Romans chapter 8. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray, for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So, tongues is definitely important and should not be put down as the weaker gift, just only one that does not edify the church in itself like the gift of prophecy does. Continuing on, I wish all of you spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets, that the church may receive edification. Now we see that tongues with interpretation actually equals that of prophecy, because the church becomes edified when both gifts are together. Verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Paul here establishes that tongues without interpretation 
is of no value in the church. Continuing on, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. Meaning, again, in the church, interpretation must happen for the edification of the believers. Verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. If there is no interpretation, this cannot happen. Verse 13, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. This instruction is for when meeting together with the congregation. This point continues into verse 16. There is nothing unscriptural for an individual to give the interpretation to the message in tongues that they themselves may have presented. Though it may be rare and seem odd to some, there is nothing scripturally opposed to it. The bottom line is, it must be in agreement with the rest of Scripture. Verse 14, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen, at your giving thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding, that I may teach others also, than 10,000 words in a tongue. I've been a part of churches where it was not only common, but the norm to hear people speaking in tongues all over the church at the same time, never once even remotely thinking they should have an interpretation given for that which is spoken in tongues. This is fine if you are by yourself, for as Paul already established in verse 4, tongues definitely edifies the spirit of the one who is speaking in tongues. But as it clearly is defined by Paul, tongues in the congregation must have an interpretation. It must be noted here that tongues in the congregation is to be that of blessing or praise. Therefore, tongues spoken in the congregation must be interpreted as such and nothing else. Verse 16 and 17 specifically informs us of this. Verse 16, Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen, at your giving thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Thus, tongues in the congregation is to be that of blessing the Lord in praise and thanksgiving. This bears witness with what happened in Acts 2, as they heard them giving praise and declaring the wonders of God. Thus, tongues and interpretation in the congregation is for praise and thanksgiving only. It must also be noted here that there are some who claim that one can receive what they call a prayer language, that being tongues, and still not have the gift of tongues. 
they basically claim that the gift of tongues is specifically for the congregation and not for the individual's personal prayer time. Nowhere in scripture is this supported. In fact, Paul identifies the gift of tongues as a gift that has the ability to edify both the individual in their prayer time and edify the congregation with interpretation. Continuing on, verse 20. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Acts 2 serves as an example here for verse 22. No interpretation was given, but there was simply men giving praise to God of his works in different languages. And those who spoke in those languages heard and wondered. Thus, tongues by itself served as a sign for the unbeliever, specifically the unbeliever who spoke those other languages. So then, tongues by themselves can serve as a sign, but only to those who speak that specific language being spoken. However, tongues spoken with no interpretation amongst those who do not speak that foreign language will be just as lost as any other, as we will see a few verses down. Verse 22 continues, But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Now is where Paul seems to make things confusing. Just after he says that tongues are for the unbeliever, and prophesying is not for the unbeliever, but rather for the believer, here in verse 22, he goes and seems to contradict himself in the following verse. Compare. Verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed, or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? He just got done saying that tongues are for the unbeliever. So why would the unbeliever who comes in hearing everyone speaking in tongues think everyone was out of their mind? The question should actually be, why wouldn't they? If the unbeliever does not speak the language that is being spoken, how can the unbeliever truly benefit? Isn't this what happened at the initial outpouring in Acts chapter 2? Those speaking in tongues benefited those who spoke those languages, yet those who did not speak those languages considered them drunk. In other words, out of their minds, like Paul says here in 1 Corinthians. This all ties with what we covered in verses 16 through 19. If verse 23 wasn't difficult enough, it continues with verse 24. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Paul said that prophecy is not for the unbeliever, but for the believer. Yet now he turns right around and shows that it benefits the unbeliever? How can this be? This is where we need to examine a little closer. Verse 22 said that tongues are a sign for the unbelievers. Why? Because it's something that they themselves speak and they hear others who do not naturally speak that language. Thus, it's a sign to them hearing a foreigner speak their native language, as it was in Acts chapter 2. Upon the initial reading of the next part of this verse, we assume that Paul is saying that prophesying is not a sign for the unbeliever. However, nothing is mentioned of the sign in the second half of this verse. It actually says, but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Paul is simply stating here that this is something only done by believers and not 
unbelievers, where tongues can be spoken by an unbeliever by way of their native language. Prophecy is only done by the believer. And in the following verses, we see that the prophecy can benefit any who hear. Continuing with verse 26. How is it, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most, three, each in turn, and let one interpret. Here we see that an order is to take place when believers are together, and again, that there must be an interpretation given to the tongues that are spoken. If there is a message in tongues, there must be an interpretation that bears witness with the scriptures. The interpretation and the scriptures are the witnesses. The interpretation may also be given by the individual who spoke the tongues, as we covered earlier. Verse 27 specifically states how many messages in tongues may be given. As long as they have an interpretation in alignment with the rest of Scripture, then it should be accepted. Continuing with verse 28, But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Again, no uninterpreted voice in the church is to occur. The initial thought here, if there is no interpreter, is that the individual who spoke in tongues must have been an heir. However, we must remember the one who was to interpret could have missed their opportunity as well. Continuing with verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Simply meaning that we should test that which is said to the word. Verse 30, but if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent, for you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. This is simply showing that order is to take place and not confusion, and whatever is said should be tested to the scriptures. The next verse tells us why. Verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Paul concludes the chapter with closing with the same topic. Verse 39, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. We now want to cover some misunderstandings that seem to have developed over the years regarding these verses and others that parallel this topic. For starters, we've heard it said before that when someone speaks in tongues, that it's the Holy Spirit taking control of the individual's tongue and speaking through them. There are several problems with this line of thinking, though. Number one, why doesn't the Holy Spirit do this with other gifts, then? Why is this said only with the gift of tongues? Why doesn't the Holy Spirit just start speaking wisdom through those with the gift of wisdom? Or start speaking knowledge through those with the gift of knowledge? What about someone with the gift of healing? Why doesn't the Holy Spirit just take control of them and start healing people? Are we to believe that when Peter healed the crippled man in front of the gate beautiful, found in Acts chapter 3, that the Spirit just took control of him to heal the cripple? Number two, saying that the Holy Spirit takes control of our tongues goes against the very fruit of the Spirit, specifically self-control, as found in Galatians chapter 5. If the Spirit gives you self-control, how can one turn around and say that the Spirit then takes control of you? Number three, we are to walk or keep in step with the Spirit, not be manipulated by Him. Again, Galatians 5 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. One who is controlled by the Spirit is one who is submissive to the Spirit, and the Spirit will never contradict the fruit He gives us. So, 
If he gives us self-control, how can he do anything against that self-control? And four, why would Paul give specific instructions on how the gift is to be used in the church, as found in 1 Corinthians 14, if the Spirit was just going to minister that gift through us anyway? If the Spirit is the one controlling the gift, why the need for the instructions? For example, 1 Corinthians 14 says, If anyone speaks in a tongue, two, or at the most three, should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. First, we see that if tongues are spoken in the church, that there must be order by way of only one at a time, and there must be an interpretation. If there is no interpretation, the one who spoke in tongues must remain silent. Here we see that there cannot be people speaking in tongues at the same time in the church. Why should this be a concern if the Spirit is the one doing the speaking? And he says that if there is no interpretation, that the one who spoke should remain silent. Again, showing that either the one who spoke was out of order, or there was to be an interpreter, but did not follow through with it. Either way, it shows that the Spirit is not using us as robots, but rather desiring us to grow in our gifts and following Him. The gifts are given to us to be His obedient servants in blessing, serving, and edifying one another. We've also heard it said before that unless one speaks in tongues, they are not filled with the Spirit. There are problems with this belief. Paul specifically said, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The implied answer is no. Thus, the absence of speaking in tongues is not proof that you are not filled with the Spirit. There is no one gift that is given to all. To prove their point, some have said that every time the Spirit was given to someone in the book of Acts, that the individual spoke in tongues. This is actually not true. Consider. Acts chapter 2. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. The context to these verses is that there were those who were laughing at these who were speaking in tongues, saying that they had had too much wine. So, the mocking was directed at those who were speaking in tongues. Notice how in verse 15 that Peter says, These men are not drunk, as you suppose. If everyone was speaking in tongues, why didn't Peter say, We are not drunk, as you suppose? Many assume that everyone there was speaking in tongues because of a misunderstanding to an important verse. Verse 4, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The assumption here is that all were speaking in tongues since they all were filled. However, the verse clearly says that they only spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them, meaning if they weren't enabled, they didn't speak. This is clearly exemplified in the fact that Peter himself differentiated himself from those who were speaking in tongues and being mocked at. Does this mean that Peter wasn't filled? Of course not. It simply means that Peter did not receive the gift of tongues on the day of Pentecost, or Shavuot in the Hebrew. Then what gift did Peter receive? Well, we know he heals a man in the next chapter and even addresses the same crowd on the day of Pentecost with boldness and speaking in the wisdom of the word. So, my initial response would have to be that his gifts were healing and the word of wisdom. Next, we've heard and seen some cases where a minister says from the pulpit, the Spirit is telling me this or that, or I feel led by the Spirit to say this or to do that. Though, 
The minister may be very well sensing in his heart to do these things. We don't believe it's using wisdom to verbalize such things in this manner. Why would be the obvious question. All too often, feelings, emotions, or even personal agendas, though they may be pure and honest in motive, can sway our thinking, plans, or even our vision as a whole. We believe the Holy Spirit can and does move upon believers, resulting in various forms of visible emotions. He gave us emotions. It's nothing odd to think that He will utilize them. However, we do not believe that every time it is said that the Spirit moved, that it is actually the case. I was personally a part of a church service where the minister felt led to not preach, but rather extend the worship time. It didn't bear witness with my spirit, but I thought it was just me. I later found out that the minister walked up to a deacon at that service and asked him, quote, Can you help me get things started? Get things started? Get what started? How many times has it been said the Spirit really moved today, when in reality the Spirit may have had nothing to do with it? Emotions were simply preyed upon. Just as the Father has given us emotions, how many times have ministers abused those emotions under the guise of the Spirit moved? Along this train of thought, there has been a move for some time now saying that the Spirit can fall on someone in such a way that they fall backwards because of the Holy Spirit. This has received many different names over the years. Names like slain in the Spirit or falling under the power of the Spirit. Terms that you will never find in the Scriptures. However, we're told it's a biblical thing. This move has also included something called laughing in the Spirit. This is where one begins laughing uncontrollably for no apparent reason. This move has also included something that has been dubbed drunk in the Spirit. This is where one literally walks around giving the exact same appearance as if they were drunk, yet the source is supposedly the Holy Spirit. One of the scriptures that is used to support this is found in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The general interpretation given is that one should not be drunk with wine, which leads to an unholy life, but be drunk in the Spirit, which leads to a holy life. Yet the scripture here is not instructing a similarity by way of a different source, but rather a complete distinction in lifestyle altogether. One leads to uncontrolled behavior, where the other leads to self-control under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Interpreting this scripture as instructing a similarity that imitates such behavior contradicts the very fruit of the Spirit that He gives us. I once heard a minister use another verse to support the supposed move of the Spirit. It's found in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine, because of the Lord and His holy words. At first glance, this could seem reasonable. However, when we look at the full context within which this verse is given, we see a completely different story. Compare. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine, because of the Lord and His holy words. We see that the opening statement here shows why Jeremiah is in the state he is in. It's concerning the prophets. And we see that this is not a state of joy or blessing, but rather of sorrow because of the word given to him by the Lord. What was the word given to him? He gives it in verse 11, but let's add the surrounding verses with it. Verse 10, the land is full of adulterers because of the curse the land lies parched and the pastures in the desert are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Both prophet and priest are godless. Even in my temple I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. 
Therefore, their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness, and they will fall. I will bring disaster on them in the year they are punished, declares the Lord. Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. I will make them eat bitter food and drink poisoned water, because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. The word actually continues, but I'm sure you get the picture. This has absolutely nothing to do with acting drunk by way of blessings from the Spirit. Jeremiah is weeping in bitter sorrow and mourning. It's as though he can barely stand as he grieves over the coming judgment to the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel that the Father has revealed to him. How one could even imagine using verse 9 as a defense to their belief of being drunk in the Spirit makes no sense at all. In fact, the very point that they use this verse in saying this is a move of God shows how they are not prophesying of God, but of a completely different spirit. And within this very text, we see the Father declaring how the prophets are prophesying by Baal. Compare how the prophets of Jeremiah's day fill the people with false hopes before the coming judgment. Verse 16, this is what the Lord Almighty says, do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. And here we are today seeing teachers and preachers of this movement give false hopes as they preach peace and prosperity and even escape by way of a pre-tribulation rapture from the coming judgment. Almost the exact same scenario that is placed before us in Jeremiah. The bottom line here is that this text gives nothing to support such a moving of the Spirit, but that it actually contradicts such a movement. It is the Father's desire that we follow the Spirit, to be controlled by the Spirit, by way of our choosing to be led. Thus, the focus is obedience. The Father doesn't want robots. He wants servants who willingly choose to obey. Thus, the more of the Spirit you have, the stronger the self-control you will have to continue in Him. Regarding the gift of tongues, there are some circles that believe that one can be taught the gift from another individual. Nothing could be further from the truth. If the Spirit doesn't teach you, then no one else should try. That would be like trying to teach an eagle to swim or an elephant to fly. If the gift has not been given to them, the gift will not manifest. Some have said that they're just trying to help others by priming the gift that has already been given to those they're helping. But if the gift has been given, the Spirit is perfectly capable of manifesting that gift in the individual. As mentioned earlier, if someone speaks in tongues and there is an interpretation, 
that interpretation must be tested to the word. All too often, this doesn't happen. Many think that if they are questioned about the interpretation they give, that their spiritual authority is challenged. How sad. None of us are above reproof. Everything that everyone does or says, especially if they claim it is from the Father, needs to be tested to the Word. However, the reproof does not come from man. It comes from the Word. Man is simply the avenue through which that reproof is funneled. Some ministers believe that if someone is going to speak in their church, that you must first go through them. This completely inhibits any freedom of obeying the Spirit. It, in fact, puts you in bondage to that leadership, or should I say, dictatorship. Nowhere in the Scriptures are we informed to ask our minister for permission to use any of the gifts. The gifts of the Spirit are just that, gifts of the Spirit. They are not called gifts of your minister, who would then decide when those gifts are to be used. If the Spirit speaks to you to use your gift, and that minister doesn't allow you, who are you obeying? It is the responsibility of the fellowship as a whole to test what has been brought forth, not just one individual. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. First, we see the word for others, is alos, which is plural for other or another. Then, for the word way, we have the word diakrantosin, which simply means to evaluate. But how can they do so if it is not allowed to be brought forth from the minister? It must be noted here that the very fact that we are informed to test everything brought forth lets us know that any gift can be misused, even with the purest of motives. Lastly, it is believed by some that the receiving of the Spirit comes at a different time from when one becomes a believer. Others believe that one is filled once they are in the faith. This is a topic that has been debated between denominations probably ever since there has been denominations. After looking into this, we believe that both are actually right. Let me explain. First, we know that the believers who received the Spirit throughout the book of Acts were already believers. So, therefore, it had to be a separate event for them. But, what about those who became believers after the Spirit had fallen in Acts 2? Was it a separate experience for them as well? Take Paul, for example. He became a believer after the Spirit had fallen. What happened with him? Acts chapter 9. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Many have said that this verse is proof that he was baptized in the Spirit after his salvation. However, chapter 22, verse 14, expounds on this event for us. Acts 22, verse 13. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one, and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. It is clear that this is baptism by water, and not the Spirit. This would lead us to believe that all who became believers after the Spirit fell in Acts 2 were filled with the Spirit at the point of conversion. However, Acts 8 gives credence to the other side of the debate. Acts chapter 8. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit 
had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And so now you see why we can say both are right. There seems to be verses that could reasonably defend either side. So our stance is, why debate it? What we do know is that he gives the Spirit to those who obey him. Acts chapter 5. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. If your pursuit in life is to obey the Father, then he will give you his Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance, as 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22, 5 verse 5, and Ephesians 1 14 informs us. If you have his Spirit in you, then you are to pursue the gifts of the Spirit as Paul instructs in 1 Corinthians 14 to help the body of Christ. We hope you have enjoyed this study. Remember, continue to test everything. Shalom.